Thank you, Jim. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. All the rest is uh, I became a retiree. I'm a retiree like you guys, so I turned to writing books, which is what I want to talk about. I know what the uh, Beatles feel like because it's you know I've seen so many of you. You're kind of like groupies. Sally's been in the front row of every talk I've given in the South. <laughs> I really am honored. <laughs> I uh, I've retired and started writing books. Um, I never intended to write a book. Uh, is that the uh, thing is when you are making history, you absolutely never realize that you are making history. Uh, when you work at the White House, nobody um, blows a trumpet when you walk in and say, ta-da, here's the day you're going to make history. Working at the White House is just like working at the Savannah River site or the insurance company. <laughs> you got to get to work early. If you get to get ahead of the power curve, and if you get to work early, you have to make the coffee because there isn't any. Just so like I harassed this poor lady to get coffee this morning. And then you sit down at your desk and you find your inbox full of messages from strange places where weird people have done ridiculous things and you have to sort through all that. <clears throat> and then the intercom rings and it's your boss and he wants a paper that you were supposed to give him last week and you didn't. And he's a guy that he was your roommate in Modesto, but at the moment he's president of the United States. So you have to, you've got to do something about it. And you do that, uh, and then you go to the White House mess and have lunch and eat all the wrong things. And then in the afternoon, some former senator comes in with some constituent who has a plan for saving Western civilization, which will only cost a billion dollars. And you have to listen to that all afternoon. And at 5.30, you say, I can't stand this anymore. I'm going to go home and have dinner with my lovely wife and children and try again tomorrow. And that's the way it is. And nobody says, oh, by the way, the papers that you were shuffling were historic. And so it wasn't until 10 years after I left the White House that I began to read other people's history and think, you know, that's not what happened. I was there. And those people don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and so uh, I began to sort through the history of what happened in ending the Cold War and how it came about. Uh, and in the process, I discovered two things in all seriousness. Number one, an enormous respect for the officers of not only the U.S. military, but the Red Army, who when nukes were involved were very careful people. And secondly, <clears throat> a phenomenon that us retirees may experience often, we all have very clear memories of Cold War events that simply never happened. <laughs> Some examples. We all know what happened to Joseph Stalin. He died of a stroke in the Kremlin in March of 1953. We know that because TASS, the Soviet news agency, tells us so. That's a bunch of bunk. He died at Konsevo, his Dasha, 10 miles outside of town. Uh, he was probably murdered, but certainly neglected to death by his security chief, Laurenti Berea, <clears throat> who basically, certainly after his stroke, uh, saw to it that it took Stalin three days to die, and Berea saw to it that there was no medical attention. Uh, and nothing happened at the Kremlin, but that's the way the story is told. Uh, we, uh, my generation remembers Dwight Eisenhower as 
a American, you know, the big hero from World War II. He came home, ran for president, said, I'll end the war in Korea. He ended the war in Korea, and then he started playing golf and nothing else happened. And as a young lieutenant, that was just fine with me. That's not the truth at all. Historians now have come to understand that Dwight Eisenhower was perhaps one of the most important people in our ultimate success in the Cold War. <clears throat> Wind back to the 50s, Eisenhower became president, Korea was going on. It was generally perceived that, by the wise men at the time that Korea was the opening gun in World War III. The bad guys were going to get us very busy in, in Asia, and once the Americans were fully committed, the Red Army was going to roll across Europe. In order to deal with that, the NATO ministers met in Lisbon in 1952, and they decided to, that the NATO allies needed to go back on a World War II footing. They were going to raise 90 divisions, uh, that the whole uh, they were, the West was going to get ready to deal with the Red Army. The budget that Eisenhower found on his desk when he assumed office in January 53 called for spending 17 to 20 percent of the GDP on defense to rebuild America to World War II power. Eisenhower had sense enough to say, no, that's not what we're going to do. Eisenhower decided to rely on what he called the new look. We're going to rely on the technology of, of the new thermonuclear weapons, uh, radar, space possibilities, jet aircraft. We're going to rely on technology to provide a deterrent, and we're going to spend about 5% of GDP on defense uh, to, to maintain some reasonable military posture. But he understood that America had been the arsenal of democracy in World War II, and it was American economy that ultimately was going to prevail in the Cold War. And that's the way it turned out. And we were very lucky that Eisenhower was president and came to be president in the 50s. Uh, the, the Eisenhower years ended with the U-2 shoot, shoot down over Sverdlovsk in May of 1960. That's a very interesting story. I was in Moscow several years ago, um, sitting with my colleagues in one of the watering holes doing research on your behalf. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and a professor said, uh, you know, where, where are you from? Well, I'm from San Francisco. He said he's from Sverdlovsk. Oh, I said, that's where my Air Force buddy uh, Gary Francis Powers, Francis Gary Powers was uh, landed unintentionally. <laughs> well, yes, he said, you know, that's, yes, that's true, but you know, he wasn't the only one. He was not the only one. He told me the following story. It, uh, when, the, when the Americans started flying the U-2s over the Soviet Union, the Soviets were really frosted because they could see them on radars, but they couldn't get up to 70,000 feet to do anything about it. But as the years went from 56 to 57, by 1960, every time a U-2 appeared over the border, the whole Soviet Union sh airspace shut down, the Politburo went in session, the word went out to the uh, commanders of the SAM batteries, if you see the U-2, shoot everything. Don't worry about aiming and tracking and so forth. We gotta get one of these guys. If you see the U-2s, push all the buttons. Okay, May of 1960, uh, Francis Gary Powers takes off from northern Pakistan. He gets up to 70,000 feet and begins to penetrate over Kazakhstan, and he's busy taking pictures and drinking coffee or whatever you do up there. Uh, but the Soviets' strategy was to track him with a couple of MiG-19s. They could only get to 42,000 feet, but nonetheless, Powers is up there at 70, and there's a couple of these guys at 42,000 feet. In case he loses gas or something happens to his aircraft, they'll get down where they could get an air-to-air -air shot at him. So these guys are tracking him, and they're flying um, through Kazakhstan, and they get to Russia, and he gets to Sverdlovsk. Unfortunately, in Sverdlovsk, there was a new SAM site that the CIA had not known had been installed. It was brand new, and so Powers flies right over the middle of it. The guy on the ground sees there it is, and per instructions, pushes all the buttons, just fire everything. Well, it didn't hit the U-2, fortunately for Powers. Um, the, got a, the one a weapon went off near the tail of his aircraft, but the U-2 is a very frail airplane, so it blew off the tail. Uh, Powers bailed out, parachuted to Earth, landed safely, uh, went to prison, and for a couple of years learned to play chess. <laughs> that, however, the guys, the Russians driving the MiG-19s were not so lucky, because they were flying at 42,000 feet, and they were blown out of the sky by their own SAMs. And the guy that told me this story said, you've got to understand, when the Red Army, you put the Red Army uniform on, you're dispensable. 
the Soviets shot their own MiG-9 pilots out of the sky, and I went in Moscow, there's a, a tombstone to Lieutenant Sergei Safarov, who was very dead, who was flying along with Francis Powers at the time. So the, uh, uh, you know, we don't understand the toll that the, that the cold, cold war took on the Soviets. Many of you, ladies and gentlemen, may, because you're in the reactor business, but most people don't understand. For instance, 1957, as you may know now, uh, the Soviets uh, had an explosion at the Mayak reactor. This was not just a bit little pop. Uh, 70 to 80 tons of crapola was blown up and lifted downstream. A quarter million people had to be evacuated from 200 towns, and we never heard anything about it until it was all over. Because 57, there was no satellites, there was no really good intelligence, that we really never heard about it until after the Cold War is over, we're sitting around with the Cold War, the Soviet scientists who said, by the way, you know, you need to know about the accident at Mayak. Um, Cuba was the defining moment of the uh, early 60s. We all uh, remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, but none of us really understand how close we came. That was a very dicey time. <clears throat> the general in charge for the, for the Soviets, General Pliev, met with Khrushchev in the summer of 62. Khrushchev said, here's what we're gonna do, we'll take these missiles, we're gonna ship them in by boats, you go over there, set them up, and we're gonna have missiles in Cuba, and you're in charge, and uh, uh, stay in touch, but if you lose communication because you're at the end of a long HF link, uh, use your judgment. Use your judgment to a guy with, in command of nuclear weapons. Dicey game. Now, it turns out at the time of the 62 crisis, there were warheads for the missiles, but General Pliev already had 98 nuclear weapons, tactical nukes, in Cuba. Uh, they were not intercontinental weapons, but they were um, anti-ship weapons, he could have taken a shot at the Navy, he probably could have attacked southern Florida, he had 98 nukes. It is mind-boggling to think what would have happened is during that crisis there was one body of thought that thought that we ought to go in and bomb the airfields and, and blow up the, attack the missile sites right now. <clears throat> if we had done that, there could be no doubt that General Pliev would have responded with nukes to take out the Navy ships, he may have attacked homes at Air Force Base in southern Florida with nukes. Now, those of you who knew him knew that General LeMay, who was the commander of the Strategic Air Command, had a very poorly developed sense of humor. <laughs> uh, he would have responded such that clearly Cuba would have been a burning cinder. The Soviets could not have took a, put up with that simply, and the fat would have been in the fire. There were 98 nukes there, and the caution, we were very lucky that the Kennedy brothers and the people who were playing the chess game in Washington said, you know, let's think this one through. It was a very close call, and people don't really understand that. 